Okay, cool. All right, well, uh, thank you guys for coming. Um, so, as uh, Pastor Mark said, that this sermon is, was supposed to be one on the cure for anxiety. Um, but as I was reading scripture and just seeking to understand what it was that God was saying, I saw that it was not simply how to, oh shoot, how to cope with or relieve anxiety, but rather it was fixing our eyes on a far superior treasure, on a far greater object rather than earthly objects. And so the key to ridding ourselves of anxiety is not some kind of thing, but it is a person, namely it is God and his care for his children. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, here we find ourselves in the Gospel of Matthew. Also, thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, so we find ourselves in the Gospel of Matthew, specifically in what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and the Sermon on the Mount was powerful in the days of Christ, and because these are the very words of God, they are powerful today and relevant today. Um, and so uh, we can get a taste ju of just how powerful these words were uh, when we look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Uh, here we see that Jesus says, or it's Matthew gives the account of Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So just to put this into perspective for us, uh, it says the Decapolis, which was a province just southeast of Galilee. It would be like somebody starting from Old Town Clovis and walking from there all the way to Visalia. And so generously... Uh, including some rest. It would probably take about 20 hours to walk from Clovis to Visalia. Um, so most likely about a day's journey. And um, this wasn't just something where you could throw some snacks and some water in the car and just drive about an hour and then, you know, get where you need to go. But all that to say that there was something that Jesus was saying. There was something that this man had that t nearby towns where they were did not have. There is something that this man had that people would travel far and wide to come here. And so with that, as the crowds began to gather, he sat up on a mountainside and began to teach. So here we find ourselves in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 through 34. Let's read. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so that if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothes himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. All right, let's start this off with some prayer. Father... I pray tonight that you would fill me with your spirit, God. 
that the words that are spoken right now are not any ideas that I have made up myself. But God, I pray that your word would speak, that we would see what it is exactly you have to say. I pray that your spirit would move in the hearts of these men and women. God, that you would beckon them and call them to a deeper relationship with you and that they would respond joyfully. So God, I pray now that your spirit would come and I pray that I would get out of the way that my seeking of approval of man, that my self-consciousness would go God, and that your glory and that your honor and that your truth and your son, Jesus Christ, would be prominent in this sermon. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, a couple of things we see at first glance from the reading of the text. Uh, first, first off, man cannot serve two masters. Therefore, he must choose what to devote himself to. But how does he go about doing that? Second, why is worry... Anxiety, why is that a fruit of no faith in God? And third, how does seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness secure for us that which we might worry about? And to sum up the answer to all three of these questions, uh, it is this. I, I, I got it down into one sentence. It says, the Christian is free to supremely delight in and devote themselves to the eternally valuable gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the blood-bought care of their Heavenly Father. I'll say that one more time. The Christian is free to supremely delight in and completely devote themselves to the eternally valuable gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the blood-bought care of their Heavenly Father. Now, I realize that's a bit of a mouthful, so let's go ahead and work through this text and see how we can come to embrace that glorious truth of God's grace and care for his children. So let's begin in verse, with verses 19 to 21. Here, Christ calls his listeners to store up treasures in heaven and not on earth. And he does this because in verse 21, he shows us that what we treasure in life, what we strive to earn, what we strive to protect and preserve in life, points to what truly matters in our heart. And this is an issue. And he points it out because he says, if your, if your treasure, if what you want to preserve, if what you invest all your life in is here, it's not going to last. Your happiness will not last. And we see this all the time, don't we? Cars, they don't last. They eventually become rust buckets and, you know, drop dead. Phones don't last. Usually the next model comes out a couple months later. Fashion trends don't last. Political trends don't last. As sad as it is, hairlines don't last. Waistlines don't last. Anything in this world that is affected by sin, it will not last. And Christ says, don't waste your time trying to preserve all these things. They are but a breath in the view of history. And in the view of redemptive history, of God's work, in this history, they do not even compare to the glory that is to be seen at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it calls us to invest our treasures in heaven. These are treasures that last forever. If there's anything that we want to bet on that is safe and secure, it is to invest everything in these treasures in heaven. But what exactly are those? What is a treasure in heaven so that we know how we ought to invest in it? And that treasure, according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 and verse 19, this treasure is the treasure of spending eternity with God. And from Psalm 63, we, or I'm sorry, Psalm 16, we know that this God is the God in which in his presence is fullness of joy and in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. There is a quality of joy. It is full. It is abundant. It is overflowing. And there is, a, there is a quantity of joy. It is forever. It is eternal. And that is the treasure that he is telling us to invest in. And that's eternal life after all, is it not? In, in John 17, 3, Jesus says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We see that heavenly treasure, eternal life, is enjoying all that God is for us in Jesus Christ forever. 
That is the imperishable, eternal inheritance that we get to enjoy. That is the inheritance that Jesus points us to now. This is the good news. This is the gospel. So how do we do that? How can we supremely delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ that we might have a treasure that lasts forever, that we might have a hope that is greater than anything that this world can bring to us? And I say to you guys, that is no coincidence that Jesus' next topic of discussion, his next flow in this argument, is about the eyes. In verse 22, Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. It's something to note. That word clear can also be translated as healthy or sincere. If heavenly treasure is that eternal life with God and delight in his presence and character, then in order for that treasure to be valid, in order for it to be an authentic treasuring, it must be genuine, affectionate treasuring, not dutiful treasuring. And this is huge that we understand. This. If we act out of duty, there is only darkness in us. There is no love for God. Rather, we dishonor God when we act out of duty instead of delight. And now, let's think of this in a husband and wife context. Uh, I'm going to lay before you two scenarios, and you'll see that to serve God with a heart of delight is far, far greater for you and for God than serving God just simply out of duty because that's what's in his word, and so you just do it. So in both scenarios, it's a date night for a husband and a wife. And in the first scenario... The husband shows up with a bouquet of roses and he rings the doorbell so that the wife can come out. And she comes out and she is wearing her best for him. And with a bashful smile, she looks at him and she says, sweetie, thank you so much for taking me out tonight. And he looks at her with a smile and he says, it's my pleasure. And I, I can tell you guys, they probably spent the rest of the night just enjoying the company of one another. But now we have scenario two. It's date night for a husband and wife, and the wife shows, or I'm sorry, the husband shows up with a bouquet of roses, and he rings the doorbell so that the wife can come out. And she comes out, and she's wearing her best. She looks great. And she looks at him with a bashful smile, and she says, sweetie, thank you so much for taking me out tonight. And with a smile, he looks at her, and he says, it's my duty. The wife's smile cracks. And she feels worthless because although her husband is right there standing right in front of her, his heart is far from her. If the eye is to behold God, if we are to sort heavenly treasures that are superior to anything here, then the eye must behold God and it must be genuine and affectionate beholding. Beholding not just of this idea of God, but specifically of the grace and the mercy that has been shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the apostle, I love this verse. I think, it, I think it's a great verse of just showing off what the gospel is. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Paul says that you know. There is an active recollection, there is an active meditation on, of the truth that Jesus Christ, though dressed in absolute splendor and absolute majesty, unlike anything we can imagine, chose to strip himself of those things, take on flesh, put himself in the form of his own creation, so that we might become rich. That through his spilt blood, that we might be taken out of poverty and become rich with Christ. And that richness is to receive eternity with God, who is the greatest treasure. So when we fix our eyes on this truth, with genuine, when we fix our eyes on this gospel, with genuine, supreme delight, then it has become our heavenly treasure. Because when we look at what the center of that treasure is, what you see is you see a heart radiating with gratitude, with thankfulness, with love, rejoicing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our heart's delight in the gospel must not only be genuine and affectionate, but it must be total. It must consume all of our lives. 
I say this because in verse 24, Jesus says, point blank, that no one can serve two masters. There is no exception. You will either hate the one and you will love the other. You will either be totally devoted to one and you will totally despise the other. And I think there's no greater testing of this than in suffering. I've seen it in my own life that when you suffer, what you truly cling to for joy and for hope is fleshed out. Will you go to prayer or will you go and binge a Netflix TV show just to kind of numb yourself from whatever this season is so that you can get through it? If we wish to store up treasures in heaven, which are imperishable and eternal, then our delight in God must be genuine and our devotion to him must be total. But that can raise some objections within us, no? It, if, if I want to be supremely delighted in God and completely devoted to him, then that means every resource that I have that I once used for myself can no, longer be determ- can no longer be used for myself. I can't define what it ought to be for me, but God now defines what it ought to be for him. And that scares us. Even so for the Christian, Christ is not saying that we shall receive complete devastation and lose everything or that we have to give everything away. But if he calls you to that, he calls you to that. Um, But as we saw before, Christ has said that our heavenly treasure requires supreme affection and total devotion to his gospel. That is the heart of our treasure. We must be ready when persecution comes, when suffering comes, because it will. We must be ready to forsake the flesh, to forsake self-preservation, and instead honor God and glorify God by showing him to be supremely valuable. But we're afraid, and in verse 25, Christ says, do not worry. Immediately we can note that, because already Christ is in anticipating objections to his, his cult. So he says that worry about what's going to happen is more or less about where is God going to take me? What is he going to call me to do? Remember that these Jews traveled probably about a day to go see this man. And they say, if I've traveled this far just to see him, where else could this take me? And Christ answered them about their worry about potentially losing what they have, potentially being taken to somewhere where they're not going to be comfortable And he does it with a couple arguments. And the first one argues from the greater to the lesser. In verse 25, he says, Do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body, as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Jesus is saying God did not give you a life just so you could focus on keeping it going. And he did not give you a body just so you could focus on putting clothes on it. But rather, God has created you for a far, far greater purpose. You were put here not for a meaningless existence, but for a purpose. He has created every man and he has created every woman for a purpose. And for the Christian specifically, it is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. And if you don't believe that you were created for a purpose, Christ calls you to take note of two realities. And this time he begins, instead of arguing from greater to lesser, it's lesser to greater. First, he points this out to the birds. He says, look at the birds. Notice that they do not sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns. There is no planning on their behalf. And you might say, okay, Rick, but those are just birds. And that is exactly the point. There is nothing that these birds could do. There is no logical reason we can come up with that these birds should be the ones to survive. They do nothing that would merit that. Yet it is because God cares for them that they do survive, that they get all that they need. Don't you, I mean, I'm sure you guys know oftentimes birds are are associated with freedom, right? But they do nothing that we do, yet they're still sustained. And Christ says, are you not more important than they? If God will support a creature who has no thought into anything, will he not also provide for you, whom he has already given a life and whom he has already given a body? And almost like a side note, he adds, if it's your life you want to prolong, how does worry about your life help? How does it increase it? 
It doesn't. Worrying is absolutely futile in this life. Then he moves on to the second example to add on from the birds and how they do no sort of planning, yet God provides for them. And again, with that question, are you not more important than they? He moves on to the lilies and he says, these lilies do not spend all their time making clothes for themselves, do they? No. But he says, not even Solomon in all his glory dressed himself like one of these. A king, and Solomon being the wealthiest king of the Old Testament, a king using all his resources could not dress himself like God would dress a flower. A flower. And Jesus adds on to it and he says, this flower that God has chosen to dress that is more glorious than Solomon, this flower that is alive today will be thrown in the furnace tomorrow. This flower is so so insignificant, yet God cares for it. And he again says, are you not more important than these flowers? Because he points out, as he noted earlier, that God created both this flower, this bird, and you. But the difference is that he has created you in his image, and he has sent me, his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to be a ransom for you, to save you from slavery and punishment of sin by his own spilt blood. So how can we be the recipient of such grace and have such mercy and such good news, yet still worry about all those things which God said, if, if, I can, if I can provide these things for the most insignificant, I can definitely provide it for you whom I have called for a specific purpose. And we see the root cause of all this. And he's, Christ deals the final blow and he says, you of little faith, if you worry about your self-preservation over the gospel and cut corners and cheat others and dishonor God so that you can maintain a comfortable situation, then it is because you do not truly trust God. What those actions say is, God, I don't truly believe you are who you say you are, my shepherd. I do not believe you are capable of what you say you are capable of to sustain me in my life and in my relationship with you. I don't care how people defame your name. I don't care that my neighbor, who I see all the time, may be destined for hell. But if I put myself out there, if I'm obedient to you, that's it. I'm toast. My reputation is down the drain. Those connections I had before are down the drain. That approval of man that I had before is down the drain. And that's why you cannot serve wealth and God. You cannot store treasures on earth earth and in heaven. You cannot genuinely and completely delight yourself in God and worry about all those meaningless things. Because when we worry about such things, it's because we have not lifted our eyes to our eternity with him, to our heavenly treasure, that far superior treasure. As the author of Hebrews shows us, when speaking of Moses, uh, I believe it's chapter 11, verse 26, he says, he, Moses, considered the reproach of Christ Greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Moses could have been worried about all those riches. He, had, he was in the palace with Pharaoh. He had status unlike his brothers. His brothers and sisters were slaves, and here he was a prince of Egypt. But instead of staying fixed on these earthly treasures, he cast his eyes upon the reality of the eternity with Christ and with faith cling to that promise that there is joy to be had with God that surpasses anything in this world. And that's what I mean when I say that Christians are free to supremely delight in and devote themselves to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every material thing and every action in this life is not the ultimate goal. Rather, each material thing and each action in our life is used to serve the higher goal, which is namely to delight in God and cause others to delight in Him as well. Christ, in the remaining verse, continues expounding what lack of faith looks like. He said, It is like the Gentiles, those who do not know God, those who are not the recipients of His grace and His mercy who worry about food and clothing and reputation, but you have a heavenly Father who knows 
all that you need. Think about that, that God is intimately aware of every single need that you have. So intimately aware of these needs that your greatest need, namely saving from hell, saving from slavery to sin, he has provided for you in the Son, in his Son, his one and only Son, Jesus Christ. Sinners who, in light of the gospel, still choose to hold to the illusion that my life is held together by me and my being fulfilled can only be managed by me. But Christ calls us to a sweet reality. The reality that we do not have to earn the Father's love. We do not have to earn the Father's care. We do not have to try and clean ourselves up so that we can finally enter into the kingdom and finally experience the righteousness of God and be approved of. But Christ instead, think about this, Christ instead with Calvary in view could look at all those who lingered with faith and lingered with hopeful eyes and he could say to them that their heavenly father would provide all that they need for this life and more importantly in the life to come. And it is because he knew that his own blood, that his own sacrifice on the cross was going to secure that for them. Christ it is why we can say wholeheartedly that the Christian is free to supremely delight in and devote themselves completely to the eternally valuable gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's because of the blood-bought care of our Heavenly Father. Life is meant for so much more than clothing and for food. If it's the cure for anxiety, it's, it's focusing our eyes on that greater treasure. It's focusing our eyes on God the hope we have at the resurrection and the communion we will have with Jesus Christ when he returns. Life is meant for much more than clothing and food. Life is meant to enjoy God and use every resource that he has so graciously given us to deepen our joy. And it's when we fix our eyes on that truth that God is glorified, that worries are relieved, and joy is deepened. Let's pray. Father, I pray that by your mercy, God, that you might show us just how temporal this world is. God, I pray that according to your mercy, you might relieve us, relieve us of this idea that we can manage life. Oh God, but as you say in Romans 8, that we are like sheep led to the slaughter for your sake, oh God that we are broken down, that things are taken from us so that you might be glorified as supremely valuable, as the ultimate treasure, as, as the greatest treasure that nothing in this world could beat. God, I pray now that as we go forth that we would trust in you. God, in these things in life which we could worry about, like status and material wealth, God, I pray that instead of fixing our eyes on these things, that we would look to you, Jesus that we would see your love for us on the cross and the hope that you have secured for us in your resurrection. God, I pray that you be glorified as we strive to use everything in our power to deepen our joy in you and store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.